With you. Um, oh, there we are. Now I can hear my voice. Um, I was hoping to start with you um, to talk a little bit about uh, precisely what we mean when we are looking for justice um, after conflict and especially how we kind of establish something has happened. Right. Uh, good morning. There's nothing like talking about mass atrocities at 10 a.m., so thank <laughs> you for joining us. Uh, I think there are three mm -hmm. flows that are happening right now. One, unfortunately, is that mass atrocities are still happening. No, after the Holocaust, we've said never again, but it continues to happen from Cambodia to Darfur to Rwanda, and now we're seeing the horrible tragedy in Syria where more than 450,000 people have been killed, uh, and we're still counting. The second trend has been about justice, which is after World War II, we did establish the Nuremberg Tribunals uh, to seek accountability. Uh, there have been other tribunals that were established for Rwanda, for Yugoslavia, uh, and other mechanisms. There have been treaties where states have incorporated those laws into their state laws. Uh, so there has been a trend toward accountability. And the other flow uh, is technology, which is a revolution that is just taking place right now. Now, you have 5 billion mobile phone users. You have 2 billion people on Facebook. You have uh, no, a huge number of people on YouTube. So how do you get accountability with this sort of evidence? That's one of the topics we want to explore. And to show how big of a challenge it is, uh, at the Center for Justice and Accountability, one of, our very, one of our cases that we filed was for Syrian war crimes on behalf of Marie Colvin, this intrepid journalist who was killed in covering the siege of Homs. If you go onto YouTube, there are more than four million videos that have been uploaded to YouTube with the keyword Syria. So how do you mine the data that's out there and something that we can explore? Yeah, exactly. And I think, Wendy, that's a perfect time to throw to you um, because when we're talking about tech, I think it could be easy to be cynical to say, well, of course, there's so many videos, there's so much nonsense out there, but it actually can be used and that's something that Eyewitness is doing. So I was wondering if you could give us a little bit of overview of what you're doing um, and also how tech can actually help deal with atrocity. Yeah, absolutely. So, so yeah. I direct a project called Eyewitness to Atrocities, and we developed a mobile camera application that human rights activists can use to photograph or videotape information related to violations, but in a manner that captures the metadata that's needed to help authenticate that for investigations and trials. So when you start, as you alluded to, taking information using smartphones, it's opened up a vast source of potential evidence that didn't exist. But the problem is that it's difficult to trace the chain of custody. It's difficult to ascertain exactly where and when it was taken, if it's been edited. And there are techniques that you can use after the fact to try and verify this information. But what we were trying to do is streamline that by giving activists a tool that could use technology and harness that power to help authenticate and verify the information up front by capturing in a manner that can't be manipulated GPS coordinates, date and time, ensuring the footage is raw, and embedding a chain of custody in the process. And so to that point, one of the hardest things that comes out of a conflict zone is actually understanding what's happening, especially in real time. Um, and now there's a flood of information that can come out of anywhere. Um, but Isildine, I was hoping you could talk to us a bit about um, your experience during the Gaza war when you were one of the only people actually being able to broadcast information out from the ground. It's important to speak about social justice, in mm -hmm. particular in post-conflict zones, but we can't take it in isolation from what happened during the conflict. We need to see the human face of the people who are suffering. It's easier to see it after and finished. And social justice, it's essential for the process of reconciliation and healing. We need to see the truth and the size of the impact of war and conflict on the human life. Uh, during the war in 2008-9, in Gaza Strip, and as a Palestinian who practiced medicine in Israel, the Israelis were seeing what is going on from one side. They don't know what is happening on the other side in Palestine, that there are human beings, hundreds, even thousands of Palestinians are killed during that war. So I was the voice at least to show the truth because in medicine, for us, the first step in the reconciliation, which is rehabilitation, is to have the accurate diagnosis. So we need to have the accurate diagnosis in order to set up the right treatment for social justice, which has one color, not biased justice, to have many standards, 
all the human life for me are equal and similar. Exactly. So, I mean, Dixon, coming to you, um, when we're talking about having the actual truth and the actual understanding of what happened on the ground, how can we actually establish that? Yeah, so let me take the case example of the Marie Colvin case that we're working on, the journalist that was killed in Syria. So we knew that she had been killed, uh, and the question was, could we prove that it was the Syrian regime that did this? How do you get that kind of data? These are the sort of questions that we start looking at. Can we identify through, uh, through social media, through what's been posted on Google, can we identify who the commanders are of the very complex security state that is in Syria? Uh, can we uh, get evidence of their statements, evidence of videos? Uh, can we get information about the missiles that were used? Can we get information about the trajectory of those missiles? Can we you know, peg down that in fact it was those missiles that were used to kill Marie Colvin as well as a French photographer and French journalist? Uh, so it's really trying to mine the data to see if we can get that kind of linkage evidence. We may look at uniforms, we may listen for accents, we may listen the, to see uh, who those individuals are who may be the perpetrators for it. It has not replaced what we have to do as lawyers and investigators. We still have to get eyewitness interviews and we have to get documents from the government. We have to, you know, you have to be able to, to uh, use them to see if all the stories hold together. So just one piece of data that we might find uh, on YouTube will not make the case, but it actually may corroborate uh, what we're finding through other, other evidence. Yeah, and so, Wendy, where does this come in with using actual tech right now? Because there's a lot of actual solutions out there that people are working with to try to actually establish this provenance, correct? Correct, but yeah. I would uh, echo exactly what Dixon said, that technology is not going to be the solution. It's not going to get you the full proof, mm -hmm. proof evidence you need. What it's going to do is facilitate the authentication, the verification, demonstrating the provenance. And importantly, just back to being a source of information that didn't exist. You have the pictures of uniforms, you have the pictures of shrapnel, you have the pictures that with the human analysis and investigation you can now put together to establish what happened. But you need that context around the images. So tech can help with determining the provenance, the chain of custody, and making sure that you can rely on that information, but you still have to investigate what that information means mm -hmm. and means and what it tells you. Yeah, and Dixon, can you give us a couple examples of some other things that are out there? There was the, and I've forgotten it three times now, so I feel like a jerk, but is the sun, uh, the system there, There's something called sun yeah. calc that can calculate the exact uh, position of the sun and the location on the earth based on the shadow that's been cast. Uh, so that's something that can verify if you have a video, people are standing there, their shadows cast, you can actually time verify what was going on there. Uh, there are geolocation and, and uh, geophysics uh, apps that can help you identify exactly where an act occurred. So when the journalist Stan Foley was beheaded, they actually could look at the settings around him and they identified exactly where it took place. Uh, so it's based on the information that they can then calculate it. Um, there's a group called the Security Monitor Force uh, that is using open source data to uh, map out command structures uh, uh, so that you can figure out what the chain of command is, what the military command is, and who might then be responsible for uh, a particular act. Because these guys aren't on LinkedIn, basically, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. Trying to, that's not a joke that's ever going to land. But <laughs> anyway, uh, Isildine, I was. When we're talking about evidence here, we're talking about you know provenance of information. What we're talking about is trust, right? Um, and I like the way that you were talking about rehabilitation um, through the lens of adopt. And I was curious um, if you could talk a little bit about what does it require to actually have trust in the process that justice is justice is being served, and then that is how you can start this rehabilitative process. Uh, it's not important to achieve justice, but how we need to know and see how it was achieved. Mm -hmm. And from my personal experience. Because social media is a sword with double edged. Mm -hmm. So it's deceiving and many people are trapped within the social media. For me, from my own experience as a Palestinian, where my three daughters in 2009 were killed. But how the social media, it was clear who killed them, who bombed the house, who shelled my house. And I was known to them. But how many people were biased? They have their own agenda and even to use the social media with Photoshop to play with games instead of taking the responsibility because mostly social justice, it needs responsibility from the people to admit and to have the courage 
to admit it. So it's important for the process of reconciliation, rehabilitation, but thanks God, I have the ability to bring my daughter's justice, not only from the perpetrator, how to keep them alive, because I am determined to keep them alive through establishment of Daughters for Life Foundation for education of girls and young women. And in this way, I can keep them alive in the minds, in the hearts, in the souls of people. And in this way, I can bring them part of the justice which I am continuing to bring it to them. I mean, it's very true. And I think that when it, bringing up social media is a whole you know, huge topic to jump, jump into, so we should. I mean, I think as we were talking earlier before this panel, social media is a very, very powerful tool in that you can have things come out from anywhere in the world. Someone can tweet something as it's happening and saying, here, this is happening, watch it. And they do, and that's just automatic now. But I think one of the biggest concerns here is what happens after the fact. And people say, oh, that actually didn't happen. And then something else, conspiracies spin out or others say that this is not real or this is fake or whatever. And then you have this huge amount of noise and you don't know what is actually coming through there. So I mean, I think Wendy, I might throw to you, but I'm just curious, like, when we're looking at this documentation of things that have happened, how do we even like, keep up with that? Right, well, I think it goes back again to that issue of context and looking at any one video isn't gonna tell you the story. So you have to be verifying that that video is what it's portraying, that it was taken where and when it was claimed, that the action's occurring. And so again, this is part technology you can apply and part human investigation. And I think what's actually probably most important with social media and where tech now can fit in to help is to capture, safeguard, catalog, and help sift the humans who are trying to analyze and compile this information into a meaningful picture of what happened. So as Dixon had mentioned, millions of videos exist. Just um, Syria is an example, and it's not just Syria, it's conflicts across the world. And at some point when justice is, we turn to justice for these uh, events, we need to be able to go back to that massive amount of information that's been compiled and determine what's relevant and sift through it. And so being able to capture it, archive it, catalog it, store it, everything securely until justice catch up, catches up with the technology, I think is an important role that, that tech can play right now for providing tools for that. Yeah, and I think um, you had said something earlier too about uh, kind of how ephemeral these records are, or they're being lost. So I was wondering if you could um, talk about a little bit about that as well, because that actually blew my mind. Like we have a huge record of things that have happened, but they're not actually uh, very uh, secure. Sure, so if you look at the role that social media has recently been playing with evidence, you have the ICC just issued an arrest warrant based primarily on videos that it uh, were posted to social media. Swedish government has held trials for Syrian war criminals based on information found on social media. But at the same time, social media platforms are trying to be you know, correctly responsible in taking down information that can be exciteful, it can be graphic and be disturbing. But the problem is then it's lost for potential evidence down the road. So there needs to be some mechanism, as I mentioned, for the point when justice catches up to these events and you have investigators and you have judicial processes to again have access to this information to be able to use it in a meaningful fashion. Yeah, Dixon, you had said this as well. I mean, this is something that, you know, when Twitter, Facebook, and Google all have so many complaints about saying these are horrible things on your networks, you need to get them off, but people actually need those records still, right? So what do we do to preserve this type of stuff, or what are the concerns that you have? Well, I think this all is very cutting edge right now, and I think with Google and Facebook and others, it's about developing some policies so those records are preserved and accessible. Uh, we also work with a group called the Open Source Lab at University of California, Berkeley, and one of the things we're exploring is can we, as information gets uploaded, take a quick photograph of everything, imagine how massive a project that is, <laughs> but for fear that it will disappear uh, or be taken down by the person who's uploaded it. Uh, and there's also technology, as you know, that uploads things and then takes it down within minutes. So is there a way to capture this data so that it can be used reserved for later. I'd add one other thing to what Wendy was saying is that uh, the use of this material in courts is still very nascent. Uh, uh, no, as lawyers and through the sieve of a process of law, 
we have to be able to be really thorough with the court and the judges who are reviewing this material to, to make sure that it's authenticated, verified, step them through what this new technology means and what this evidence, what the probity of the evidence actually is. Yeah, I mean, how do you, what is the process of showing that a tweet is actually something legally relevant? I mean. yeah, so if, if there were a tweet saying, no, I'm very proud to have been the person who pulled the trigger that killed uh, X, uh, you would not go into court with that tweet only. You would go into court with that tweet plus so much more evidence. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think um, showing that as a portrait of stuff that is happening is what's so interesting because we do have such a huge pace of just media coming out from anywhere in the world. And that was something, um, Isaldine, that you had talked about earlier in terms of social media being a double-edged sword. And we can see so much of things that are happening but we don't actually know if that's the actual portrait. And I was wondering if you could talk about that from kind of a more human perspective, saying what is it actually that we're seeing and can we actually trust that that's really what's happening on the ground? It's important for social media, even videos, to document and to use them at the court. It's not the only use. What happened after the math of the conflict? What happened during the war? Mm -hmm. That's important and I believe war is not to be documented. It's to be prevented and to avoid it in the future. We need to prevent any more suffering. We left and we ended the conflict, but how many souls, the wounds inside the hearts, the people, in particular women and the children, what about the life of the people after? And that's the main focus. We need to bring these people justice and to heal them and to help them to resume functionality and to, to get beyond what happened. And that's what is needed from the social media to expose the suffering of the human beings, not just to document it. Documenting it is a good aspect, but the most important, as in medicine, we focus on the prevention of diseases, not uh, treating diseases. Yeah, exactly, and I think that um, alludes to a very you know, complex and kind of terrifying point is that for conflicts all over the world in the last five years, you can find video of it happening. You know, people putting GoPro on a tank and then they're driving around shooting things and blowing stuff up. Like, it's very, very interesting how this is being portrayed and then it's something that then completely changes the way that we think and frame these things. Um, and I'm curious, uh, and I'll put this to any of you, but I'm curious, looking after the fact, uh, when we look back at a conflict, how can we actually take that perception and say, this is not necessarily the entire picture. What do we establish actually happen so that we can have justice and reconciliation? For the Center for Justice and Accountability, the way that we approach any of these atrocity crimes is, mm -hmm. first, is with the victims and survivors. They're the ones who have to own the process. They're the ones that need to drive the process. And what the Center for Justice and Accountability can do is, uh, you know, through our investigations, is at least bring truth to what happened uh, in a very sober, studied way. Uh, we may be able to bring the case into a court of law and get accountability from it. We're hoping through this that we may able to be able to develop the law. We're going to try to develop precedence on use of uh, the data, sort of data that we're getting online. We've developed precedence around uh, uh, rape as a form of touch torture. We've developed precedence around immunity. Uh, so you're developing the law so that others can use it. And ultimately, you're hoping you're shaping the democratic institutions, that you're strengthening them. And it's those very institutions that failed the victims and the survivors in the first place. So this is sort of how we see the, our theory of change of how to move from an atrocity situation post-conflict uh, to a situation where uh, the justice is thriving. Mm -hmm. Actually, if I could piggyback on uh, the point about making sure that the survivors and the witnesses and the individuals affected stay in the center of the process. Technology's been very good in democratizing the collection of evidence and the storytelling, but it also allows for easier loss of control of that information in that story. And so someone may be taking a picture of a scene that they see and they post it and they're not paying attention to who's in it and who's identifiable. They don't necessarily have the permission of, of the victim. Then that's taken and that's shared and that's pushed forward. And so traditionally when you were investigating crimes, you had an investigator and they went and they spoke with the witness, they spoke with the victim, they got their permission, they knew how the information was going to be used, and that's not really the case with technology because it allows a greater distance between those on the ground affected by the events and those who are eventually going to use the information, either for good or bad. And so I think what we also need to focus on and what needs to keep up with the pace of technology is how we keep the survivors involved and how they have ownership in this process and a, and a role to play. 
you know, is Ladine is exactly what you talk about and saying that we need to actually have a personal connection to what's happening so we know not to do it again, correct? Yeah, uh, technology is vital and it's very helpful. We don't have a problem with technology. The problem with the people who are using the technology, they have uh, their own agenda mostly, you know, not to be polarized or trapped with what is going on. That's important and to advocate for humanity to have the evidence and when we speak about justice, for personally, justice has one color. I know it. Put yourself in the position of others. If you accept it, accept it for others. And not even democracy. We want the people to be free. Even these people who suffered from the conflict, to be free from the suffering of this conflict, to be healed, to be to run their normal life, and also the perpetrator to be free from the fear and to avoid, of course, justice. It's important for us. You speak about democracy, even these countries, post conflict zones. We need to take the context of these post conflict zones. Which post conflict? What do we mean? They are fragile countries. They are not the stable countries. What about the level of literacy in these countries, the economic, the infrastructure, and the issue of power? So we must not speak. We need to take this into consideration to enable us to move forward and not to be just focusing on social media. Yeah, and I think that's a brilliant point when we're talking about tech and you know, justice, but also reconciliation. It's so much more than just necessarily documenting what happened, but it's also how do we fix everything else that's there. Um, it's something that we've seen in Colombia um, with negotiations with FARC um, and trying to come to a peace agreement. Um, people can't even necessarily agree on things that have happened or what needs to be done. And that's obviously a human issue, but it's also can be facilitated through actually having better tech solutions. So um, since we are at a tech conference, um, I'm curious, um, for all of you, what is it that's actually something you'd like to see out there? What is something that you would want to see in the future? What do we need to develop in tech to actually make um, justice and reconciliation something easier to, facil for, to facilitate it? Yeah. Uh, for me, that's a difficult question. As a lawyer, I don't think like somebody who's <laughs> an innovator in tech. Uh, but think of uh, you know, a beach and we're trying to find a grain of sand or an ocean and we're trying to identify that molecule of water. That is sort of what we're facing with the uh, advances of technology and, and putting potential evidences out there. So innovators out there who can figure out the continuing algorithms to help sift through the you know, uh, four million hours of Syria-related YouTube videos uh, is something that would make our jobs as investigators and lawyers easier. Yeah, I was wondering actually if you could break this down a little bit more. Like, What is the actual data out there that you're looking for? I mean, there's mountains of just stuff, but what is it that you're trying to get through? So if the person does the tweet that you said in your example before, that may be the first indication of the perpetrator, but we need to find out more. So with that person who's the perpetrator, can we find out more information? Has this person made more statements out there? Have other individuals corroborated that this individual is the one who was the perpetrator of this act? No, uh, no. what is that person's role in the government? What, uh, is this person in a police unit? Is this person in an intelligence agency? Is this person in, a, in, a, in the military? Uh, is it interconnected? No. Did somebody give this person the order, even though they may have pulled the trigger? Uh, did somebody else give the order? These are all the sorts of things that we try to look for in building a case. Yeah, I and mean it's everything sifting through just the noise of the internet because in there is truth, right? So yeah, so Wendy, how do you actually establish that truth, or how do you know that something is real uh, online? So I think it goes back to um, the point I made earlier that w technology is never going to tell you that it's real. Technology is going to help to eliminate some of the doubts along the way and make it the process of verifying whether or not it's true more streamlined. So if you can use technology to give you an indication of where it took place, you can save some of your resources from having to do the more time-consuming angle of the sun, looking for landmarks, things along those lines. Um, if you can have technology that helps show that it hasn't been edited, it can streamline your resource use so that you're not having to do frame by frame forensic analyses of a piece of footage. So you can use tools to help make it harder to fake information, which helps you identify what's going on, but you're always going to have that human component that needs to be involved in determining if something is real. I think there's no firm tech standard of, yes, this is real, no, it's not. There isn't, which is <laughs> where a lot of our problems are coming from these days. But um, I was curious if the, 
you could also speak about the fact that this isn't just something that we have to create solutions just for this. There's other areas of tech that we can pull from, right? That could also help kind of support establishing this stuff. So where else does, where else could solutions come from, I guess? Well, I think one thing that we need to look at is n not just streamlining how we can incorporate it, the information into justice and, and how it's going to make our lives easier, but how it's going to make it easier for individuals on the ground to be collecting and sharing information. And, and from that, I think you can pull from other lessons in, in other type of tech applications about what works in certain environments and what doesn't. And so what the end of the day we really need tech to be looking at is what makes it easier and safer for individuals to capture verifiable information and share in a secure manner verifiable information. And so if I look at it from the perspective of the organizations we're partnered with on the ground using our app and collecting information, these are the concerns that they're bringing to the table. So to the extent to which this type of technology can be mainstream, so we don't have to have a specialized app like Eyewitness actually to capture verifiable information. If there's a way tech companies can incorporate these standards into phone cameras and things, that would help, I think, go a long way to securing individuals um, better infrastructure for transmitting information, more access to data, access to power, just the very basics actually are, are what's holding a lot of people back from being able to harness all the power of tech that does currently exist to capture this information. Yep, go ahead. I, I'd add, uh, there's some areas, other areas of tech as well to think about. So for example, now think of all the different uh, investigative and police forces around the globe. They're trying to share information, but they still need more tech to share that information even more rapidly and accurately. Facial recognition, there are huge advances in facial recognition, but there can be even more advances in facial recognition. One of the things that we ro rely upon is actually forensic anthropology. You know, there are individuals who go in and exhume the mass graves and try to determine who's in there and determine whether or not there was genocide or crimes against humanity. But that field can continue to be revolutionized. So there are ways beyond social media uh, and mobile phone use where tech can play a huge role. Yeah, and a lot of it is also the control of information, um, or even just the ability to get information out from a place. So, uh, Isaldina, I was wondering if you could talk a bit about that in 2008, 2009, for you actually trying to speak about what was happening and how, because things were shut down. People were trying to control everything that came out of the region. And, and that's which comes to the power, because uh, during war, the power of one country to prevent spread of information and to make it as a secret, not to disclose it. But by the end, I fully believe what we call it the sun, one day it will come back and we will see the truth. So I was the voice of the truth of what is going on inside Palestine in Gaza Strip to spread it even in a wise way. So it's important for us when we speak about the social media, we need to have order in this world and order to have order in this world as people who are equal, not we and they. We in this world, we are equal because we all face the same risk, not related to the power. So social media, they need to advocate for justice, for equality, for humanity, and exposing the truth, whatever the risk of that. It's important and no one is beyond justice. All of them are accountable and to hold all governments to be accountable to justice. And even the bad words, when someone is tweeting or sending a message which is a provocative incitement which leads to fear and the leads to hatred, even these days we see it, many leaders of our world, without mentioning any leader who is using the social media for incitement and leads to fear against a certain ethnic or religious group. And the other issue, we need to equalize between people. If someone is killed in Afghanistan, we need to give that person the normal and the face and the humanity to that person. He is not a number. And if someone else is killed in another place, there are numbers here and there they have names and they have faces. That's the most important if we want to achieve social justice and to have order in our world. That's absolutely correct. I mean, I think that's, you know, that's the promise of the internet, right? Is that the promise of the internet should be that everyone has an open platform to be able to get information out there. But now at the point we are in 2017, um, where everything is a mess, uh, how can we trust anything? Can we trust that what has been said is correct, which is something that we need to establish, as you said? And also, can we actually trust that what we're hearing is everything that we need to hear? You know, people sh are shutting off the internet, 
the internet can just go off. I think it's off in France right now. Um, and it also, uh, people can control information based on who's in power. So um, yeah, I think we're running out of time here. So I want to put it to all of you. Where do you think that we're going? What is the future? What do you want to see um, to actually make this more open, more clear, and uh, more trustworthy? One thing we haven't talked about is risk mitigation as well. So in the case of Marie Colvin, it's very much what Isaldine was talking about, is trying to get information out in a very difficult situation. Uh, Marie Colvin had uh, come across the border uh, uh, from Lebanon into Syria, and it was uh, citizen journalists who were trying to get the story out about what was happening in country. And they had been able to procure satellite phones. They created a, a media center in Hans called Baba Amr. And Marie Colvin, her story is she gave her last broadcast to Anderson Cooper on CNN uh, and said it's an utter lie uh, that they're killing insurgents. They're killing a city of cold, starving citizens. It was the regime then that intercepted uh, that satellite broadcast and sent in missiles a couple hours later that killed her. No, autocratic regimes, they're also using malware and, and infecting computers to try to get the emails of people that they seem to think are insurgents back in country and then killing them. So we need to think through the risk issues as well. Where I hope this goes ultimately is back to the bigger framework that I mentioned, which is I think there is continuing efforts at justice and accountability globally in state, and we need to build out that kind of rule of law. And I think the evidence that we can collect through that hopefully through more open mechanisms that are secure, uh, can add to the, the evidence to, to convict people for these mm -hmm. mass atrocities. Absolutely. And Isladine, what would you like to see in the world? I, I encourage the people to look around, to ask, to learn, and connect with each other, and to seek the evidence. That's the only way. I want to see the world now, which all are under risk. We live and ride one boat. We must protect our boat as equal as one nation, as one people, in order to live a peaceful life. Hopefully, yes. And so, Wendy, where do you think we're going? <coughs> Quickly. Can uh, we get there? I, do, I, do, I think so. I, I don't think we're going to stop misinformation being shared, mm -hmm. but I do think that we can make the accurate information louder, and that's what we need to do. That's beautiful. All right, well, that's all of our time here, so thank all of you for joining us. I know that um, we'll all just be milling about if you want to chat more, have thoughts. There's so many things that we could try to do to solve this, um, but I appreciate all of you for letting me pick your brain here. It's fantastic. Thank so you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. oh.